Hello and welcome to Writing Vivid Settings. This video is intended as an overview for my setting workshop and probably won't go super in-depth into a lot of these topics, but I'm hoping that people will find it useful as a video to give an overview of why setting is important and how to develop it in your novels. So first, let's think about what setting really is. It's the foundation of your story. Setting informs character behavior, creates a world for the reader to inhabit, and adds unique color to a story. The setting should be like a character or a living, breathing part of the story. So the crucial question that you have to ask yourself when choosing a setting is why is this setting the only location or universe where your story could take place? I want to draw a distinction between setting and world building because what we're really talking about in this workshop is world building. So setting is just where this story takes place. Cincinnati, Paris, the moon. World building is really anything and everything in the world where the story takes place. So it's not just a location. It's also all of the politics, the occupations, the flora and fauna and how it affects the characters and all of that information. I pulled this quote from a Chuck Wendig post because I think it's really useful in illustrating what world building really is. And Chuck Wendig says, we're talking the revelation of your story world and its details through the story itself. It's easy to think that this means setting, but that's way too simple. World building covers everything and anything inside that world. Money, clothing, territorial boundaries, tribal customs, building materials, imports and exports, transportation, sex, food, the various types of monkeys that people possess, whether the world does or does not contain satanic twerking rights, etc. This bears further reiterating, world building supports story, not just plot, which means that your world building supports mood, theme, conflict, character, culture, setting. It does not have to move only the sequence of events further. The details of the world you've just created can and should engage with the whole narrative, not just action and event. So to get into a little bit more of what all that means, I wanted to break down a few different kinds of settings and compare and contrast a little bit and talk about why these particular settings might be good for certain kinds of stories or not. So first I want to talk about town versus city. So these are sort of quaint, rural, small town, romances, that kind of thing, versus a story set in the city. So first, let's talk about small towns. Small towns are typically close-knit communities. There's more potential for rumor and scandal in a small town because everybody kind of knows each other. Small towns are typically fictional in many novels. Um, not always, it's not... a tried and true, but oftentimes, um, particularly in romance, there'll be a fictional town created around which a series is set, for example. But even if your story is fictional, it should still adhere to how small towns typically function. Small towns differ by region in terms of geography, climate, architecture, dialect, accents, customs, politics. Think about New England versus the Deep South, for example. In other words, your small town should never be generic. Some really good examples of small town books include romances by Nora Roberts, Susan Elizabeth Phillips, Kristen Higgins, Jill Shalvis, Shannon Stacy, and Charlene Harris. Um, and a literary fiction example is Faulkner, who does a really uh, interesting job of conceptualizing a small town in Mississippi where pretty much all of his novels take place and builds a whole world around that. So think about what makes your small town special. And why could your story only take place in this location? I have a case study, the Blue Heron series by Kristen Higgins. So in this, this series is set in upstate New York's Finger Lakes region. The Blue Heron is a winery that is really the center of the town's economy. The town where the series takes place is fictional, but it still is very grounded in the, ge in the geographical area. So um, if you've ever been to Ithaca, for example, you probably have a sense for what the area is like, and the book really feels like it takes place there. There's a bar downtown that's kind of the local gathering spot for everybody in the book. Sometimes secondary characters get their own books, but sometimes they're just part of the larger community. So 
uh, in this universe, there are a lot of side characters that pop in and out. They maybe they tend the bar or they own a business or they're just they add color and life and really flesh out this town. And the key is that the region, this region is really different from other small town romances that you may have read. So, for example, it's different from, say, Jill Chavez's Lucky Harbor series, which is set in the Pacific Northwest. So those towns feel really different and distinct from each other. If you're writing a small town set story that can just be lifted out and plopped anywhere else without changing anything, then you haven't done enough to develop the story. Next, let's talk about big cities. Big cities generally have large and diverse populations. That's really important. Diversity is important because no American city is all white. Uh, I'm not saying necessarily that if you're a white author that you should write protagonists of color, but it is important to think about when you're populating the universe of your story that you include people of color because they exist. Uh, the thing with big cities is that it's easier to get lost in a crowd, so scandal isn't as much of a consideration as it would be in a small town. Um, cities tend to be more anonymous, for example. The way people operate in cities is really different. They may walk or take mass transit more. Uh, they may never speak to their neighbors. That's sort of part of the anonymity of the city. Uh, and cities are different from each other in terms of culture, architect, the general vibe of the city. Uh, New York is different from Chicago or Boston, L.A. or Seattle. Uh, so the character of the city where you set your story should really be evident in the story itself. Think about why you're choosing that particular city for your story, your setting, and how that city affects the story. Fictional cities are okay too. Uh, think about Gotham or Metropolis from the comics. Uh, some examples of authors who I think do cities pretty well are Janet Ivanovich's series is set in Trenton. Uh, Greg Heron writes mysteries that are set in New Orleans and uh, the first time I read one of his books I thought the city was so well drawn that I really wanted to go there. Uh, Damon Swade writes romances set in New York City. Julie James writes romances set in Chicago. J.R. Ward's books are all set in Caldwell, New York, which is a fictional city. And literary fiction, I picked Fitzgerald for the way that he writes about New York and um, and although it's of its time, the setting is developed in a way that like even West Egg and The Great Gatsby is a fictional town, but it's based on a real town, and you can see details in the way that he draws the city that help uh, pull the reader in and see what he's describing. I have two case studies for city set stories. The first is Stephanie Plum. And this is a real city of Trenton, New Jersey, where uh, the series is takes place. The story is about a bounty hunter who tracks down bail jumpers and it makes sense for the story to be set in Trenton because that's the it's a governmental seat. It's the capital of New Jersey. And there are a lot of jokes about New Jersey. Um, I'm from New Jersey originally so I appreciate things like that. The kinds of characters who pop up in the story, a character like Lula for example if you're familiar with the story, are likely to only be found in cities. Lula is a prostitute or it is when she's first introduced in the series. Not to mention, crime is generally higher in city, making more potential for there to be bail jumpers. So it, because of Stephanie Plum's job, it makes sense for her to live in a city. But Trenton is not a huge city, um, and so it's not even the biggest city in New Jersey. So there are still some small town elements that kind of come into and be a part of the story. And I think that's actually true of anywhere you set a novel, even if you're setting it in New York City, for example. Although there is a lot of anonymity, at the same time, people tend to carve out their own communities. So you can have people who gather in the same spots or who have a group of friends or who build their own families in these places that can really create some of the same small town vibes, but it's in a big city. A fictional story example is J.R. Ward's Caldwell. So Caldwell is a small town on the Hudson River. I, in my head, it's Poughkeepsie. In New York, but I don't know if that's really true. That's just a, approximately where I think it is geographically. And it's big enough to have apartment buildings and clubs and all of the general things that cities typically have that small towns don't. But at the same time, it's not so big that the Black Dagger Brotherhood can't have this huge compound on the edge of town. Uh, 
And it's still really grounded in its geographical area. It's in upstate New York, and that geography plays a role in the stories in the, in the whole series. There's also room for weird stuff to happen without regular humans noticing. So cities also tend to have side streets and alleys and little nooks and things. And um, that means that the characters can like go somewhere hidden to have a fight. And normal humans won't see them fighting. It also means that J.R. World can kind of make her own rules because she's writing a paranormal universe anyway where there are vampires and things. So creating a fictional city means that she can really make up what's in the city and have a lot of freedom to put things where they need to be in order to make sense rather than trying to fit her story into an existing city. Sidebar, the devil is in the details. Now, one trap that a lot of authors fall into is that in order to create settings that feel realistic, they include a lot of detail. If your story is set in a real town or city, that kind of specificity can sometimes pull a knowledgeable reader out of the story. I pulled this example from something I read many years ago, uh, but changed the character name for anonymity. But the line was something like, Joe took the C train from 207th Street to West 4th Street. Now... This seems innocent enough, but I, as a New Yorker who used to live in Upper Manhattan, know that the C train doesn't go to 207th Street. And if I did take the C train, it's a local train, so it would take two hours to get from Upper Manhattan to West 4th Street. Now, I know that as a New Yorker, but if I'm a writer who's just looking at a subway map, it does kind of look on the map like the C train goes all the way to 207th Street. But this is the kind of detail that unless you really know what you're writing about, if you're just looking at maps and making guesses, it's probably better not to be super specific. You could just say, Joe took the subway downtown, and the same piece of information is given across. I put the cover of Stephen King's The Dark Half here because there's here's also a similar example. The beginning of The Dark Half is takes place in my hometown of Bergenfield, New Jersey, but it's clear from reading the book that Stephen King literally just like threw a dart at New Jersey and picked a small town to write about because nothing that Stephen King describes in the beginning of the book resembles the actual town in any way. Um, and that to me as a reader, at first I was like, oh, cool, look at this like itty bitty town that I live in is in a Stephen King book. But at the same time, it's like, oh, but none of these details are correct. And that pulls me as the reader right out of the story because I know New Jersey and I know New York City and so if there are details in the story that are wrong it's going to be distracting to me as a reader which means obviously that you should do your research and we'll talk about that a little bit further along in the video but at the same time think about how much detail is really necessary to include to get your point across. Next I want to talk about historical versus contemporary. I've given whole workshops on how to do historical research. We're not going to get into that super in depth here, but just to give kind of an overview of thinking how to think about historical settings. So how is the time period different from today? How is it alien? How is it surprising? Think about how the setting is really different from how we live today. And the reason you want to think about that is that historical novels really require the kind of world building that fantasy novels do. Meaning that because most people living today would not have experienced your setting because it's prohibitively long ago, you want to make sure that you're providing enough detail that the reader can latch on to it to really picture the world that your characters are inhabiting. Also think about the generic 19th century Britain, which is pretty common for historical romance novels, which like often I have found um, in wallpaper historicals in particular, there isn't even really a date given for when the story takes place. It's just sort of vaguely 19th century, but there are distinct historical periods like the Regency or the Victorian period. Um, other popular historical periods are really different from each other, but if you run into them in fiction or in romance, you have medievals or uh, books set in antebellum America or the Gilded Age or the Edwardian Age or the Jazz Age. And all of these time periods are really different and distinct from each other in terms of fashion, in terms of architecture, in terms of social norms, in terms of um, all these like lots of different things that 
make them distinct and make them interesting settings. And you want to make sure that you're getting some of that detail in there. Since I most frequently teach this workshop for a romance audience, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Regency. Regency novels are super popular, but they exist in sort of an alternate universe Regency period. So the actual Regency is the reign of Prince George, who later became George IV, who ruled England from 1811 until 1820, while his father, George III, suffered from madness. They Contemporary doctors think that they figured out what was causing it, but in any way, he was incapacitated, which meant that the Prince Regent was ruling in his stead while he was still alive. When George III died in 1820, George IV then ascended to the throne. This was a time of great prosperity and ostentatiousness in, English, in England, but Prinny, as the Prince Regent was known, was not an especially effective leader, and so there was also great poverty and suffering among the lower classes. And it's actually... It's a very short but really fascinating period in British history. Um, I recommend reading books on it just because I find it interesting. But the thing with Regency romance is that it is to Regency England kind of how Sex in the City is to New York City. Regency romance is typically based on Pride and Prejudice to an extent, but through the filter of Georgette Heyer, who was writing more than 100 years after Jane Austen, and then through the lens of early bodice ripper authors like um, Kathleen Woodowis and Judith McNaught, who were writing Regency set historical novels, and then sort of their interpretation. And then here we are all these decades later, and we have as readers certain expectations for what should be in a Regency romance novel. And some of it is based on real history, but some of it is sort of based on these tropes and conventions that have been developed over many years. So whether this is good or bad is up for debate, but it's worth thinking about it when you're researching setting. And I actually think that it's fine for you to have sort of an alternate universe history, but just be conscious of that's what, like, that's what you're doing. Now, if you're writing contemporary, think about a specific year versus a vague present day. Uh, I recommend keeping technology kind of vague in order to keep your book more timeless. Um, or you run into the Kay Scarpetta problem where in Patricia Cornwall's early novels, Kay Scarpetta is in, works in the medical examiner's office and is still working with computers that are black screens with green text. And, you know, that's kind of fun and quaint, but it as a contemporary reader, it reads a little 90s. So technology like computers or cell phones are probably fine. But any kind of flash in the pan technology can really ground a story in a specific moment and make it feel dated. The same kind of goes for pop culture. Uh, and I, well, we can talk about this more in the workshop itself, but one of the things about pop culture references is that if it's anything that's too flash in the pan or too specific, or if it's something that you know because you are a writer of a certain age, but your characters who are 15 years younger than you are probably wouldn't, it's good to think critically about what you're including. So like just Sex in the City is a pretty solid example since we just mentioned it, but like if you have a character who's 25 and who you know was a toddler when Sex in the City was on the air, then probably they're not going to be big fans of Sex in the City. So it doesn't make sense for them to, to like we got about the show. Um so just think critically when you're including those kinds of details. I want to have a sidebar about occupations because how the characters' occupations affect the story is really important. So, for example, in Nora Roberts' book Chasing Fire, the characters are all fire jumpers. So they're, you know, very courageous people who have very difficult jobs where they get up in planes and they put out wildfires. And they, they get on the ground, too. And um, that the danger part of their career is part of the story and their careers are really integral to the characters. And I think that often this is something that I think gets overlooked sometimes, but careers can actually be really important, particularly uh, depending on your genre. So if you're writing a sports romance, that means that like obviously your the character's occupation, if they're an athlete, is going to be super important to who they are as a character. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're developing your story. Next, I want to talk a little bit about fantasy stories and fantasy settings. Now, in fictional settings, there are really two approaches to 
pull us into the world of your story. If you're writing spec fic or fantasy or urban fantasy or paranormal or whatever it is, you can either drop us right into the world. Uh, my go-to example for this is the first Game of Thrones book where George R.R. Martin opens the first page and we're literally dropped into a scene where there's just a bunch of guys sitting around talking and they're throwing around a lot of slang that's specific to the story, but or it's specific to the world where the book takes place. But there's not really any context or explanation given. We just have to kind of figure out what they're talking about based on clues in the story. And then we're just in the world and things just and happen in that around the characters. And so there's not really like Martin, at least in the first book, doesn't take much time out to explain what's happening in the world. He just paints a picture and you live in it or you send in an outsider. This is more of the Harry Potter approach where you have a character who grew up in the muggle world, but is pulled into the world of magic. And now because he had no prior knowledge of magic as he, when he arrives at Hogwarts, everyone has to explain things to him, which means that it's a lot of world building and explanation via other characters who have to explain things to Harry. Uh, either of these approaches is fine. Um, it may depend on your story. And it's also important when thinking about imaginary settings that they can be really literally anything like the sky's the limit as far as your imagination goes, but they should have internal logic and rules. So, uh, well, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So vampires can be pretty much anything just in books that I have read or across pop culture. Vampires can either disintegrate in sunlight, get severe sunburns in sunlight, sparkle in sunlight, turn into bats, sleep in coffins, sleep in beds, can be killed by a stick through the heart, can be killed by beheading, they get sick when they eat human food, they can eat human food but still need to drink blood, they can drink human, they can only drink human blood, they can survive on animal blood, they can turn humans by feeding them, they can hurt, turn humans by feeding them blood, etc, etc. So, there's sort of two aspects to developing a paranormal or a fantasy world, which are that if you have paranormal creatures, you have to have rules for them to write them consistently. And don't take for granted that your reader knows because all of these creatures, even if they're really common in pop culture or mythology, are still going to have different rules depending on the story. So vampires are a really good example because they're so common in pop culture and because the rules are slightly different in each property you look at, which means that you as the writer have to sit down and sort of make a list of, okay, here are what my vampires, like, these are the rules for these vampires. This is how they operate in my world. This is how it's different from others, etc. cetera. Uh, I wrote a paranormal romance many years ago that has characters who are ghosts and I literally have a file on my hard drive called Rules for Ghosts because I had to sit there and work out, okay, no one can see them, but they can move objects, but only under these circumstances and et cetera. So you want to make sure that you're thinking about rules for your particular universe. Um, and there should be some kind of internal logic. And the same goes if you're writing a broader fantasy world, like what does the gov what is the government like? Is there a governing body at all? Um, are there kings and queens or is it civil government? Are there, what, are there towns and cities and how far apart are they? And what's the geography like, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, you would develop a fantasy world the same way that you would a real world, but obviously you can embellish it however you like. Next, I want to talk about some tools for developing your world. If you're setting, to, if you're setting a book in a real place, uh, these are just some things that I think are really handy for developing those settings. So I use Google Maps Street View all the time. And particularly if it's something that you're going to uh, see, if you want to see like there's a, what the architecture on a particular street looks like, for example, or local websites or blogs, so if, if you're in New York City, maybe you look at Gothamist or you look at Patch or you look at some of the like local blogs to get a sense for slang, um, hot topics in that part of the world, um, what's happening in the news. Travel websites can also be really useful, but keep in mind that travel websites are often from the perspective of a tourist and not from a resident. 
So they will give you some like good snapshot information, particularly if you're looking for things like how do like neighborhoods in a city differ from each other, but they're not going to give you like a real resonant eye on what living there is like, but your mileage may vary with that. Uh, local transit websites are also really useful. Uh, I find that even when I'm setting things set in New York City where I live, I don't always remember which trains go where, so I tend to use them as references. Or if I'm setting a book in Chicago or um, somewhere, or like D.C. with the metro, whatever it is. I also highly, highly recommend uh, using beta readers or hiring someone to give a read of a piece just to for places that you've either never been or don't know well. For example, I wrote a book that I set in Chicago, which is a city that I know reasonably well. I've been there a number of times. I have a lot of family there, but I've never experienced it as a resident. So I got a friend of mine who lives in Chicago to read my novel just to sort of make sure that I hadn't made any big blunders with how I had described the city. Include lots of details to help, you, help your your reader picture what you're describing, but as I just said before, be careful about accuracy. It's cool to make stuff up as long as it makes sense in context. Um, fictional restaurants in real cities are fine, for example. Uh, and then one thing that one of my old critiques groups used to really get into fights about was like the really persnickety details of a city. So we once actually had a fight about whether it was realistic for a trash can to be on a particular corner. And honestly, it doesn't matter whether or not there's actually a trash can on the corner of 86th and Amsterdam, as long as it makes sense for it to be there. So... For example, if you're writing about a fictional restaurant, it makes sense to put it on a major avenue in New York City where there are a bunch of other businesses and it can be fictional and it's fine, but you wouldn't plunk a restaurant in the middle of like a residential neighborhood in Brooklyn if there are no restaurants there now. Just something to think about. Also, makes, think about what makes sense versus what's actually true and how to decide whether to include a detail. This is another thing my old critique group used to fight about because New York City doesn't really have alleys as there are in other cities. I mean, they exist, but they're not common and that means that if you have like a fight scene that has to take place in an alley because the characters don't want to get arrested for fighting in public then think about where that might actually take place just think about um the way your city operates basically now if you're write writing historical i have a handout for this on how to do research for historical fiction that i will share as part of the workshop but resources that you might also need if you're doing historical research are historical maps, which I find super useful. There are a ton online, particularly if you're looking at libraries. Um, the library in the city that you're researching probably has historical maps, and they're useful because not all street names stay constant or the same over time, or streets are built later. So like uh, for example, there, if you're writing Regency, for example, but you're looking at contemporary maps of London, that's not going to be very helpful to you because there are streets that exist now that did not exist in the Regency, and there are also streets that had different names. Um, also, in New York City, like, the Bronx wasn't really a thing in the 19th century. It was all farmland. So, like, stuff like that is useful to know. Libraries are absolutely your friend. Um, often, big libraries will have research librarians on staff, and they will be your best friends. I wrote a book where I had characters who were part of the NYPD and it is incredibly difficult to find uh, historical information on the police department in New York City prior to 1898, which is when the NYPD was founded and my book was taking place a few years before that. So I needed help finding how, I, I didn't know how the police department was built, how it operated, how it was structured, who was in charge of it. But a friend of mine is a research librarian at the New York Public Library, or she was a few years ago, and I emailed her and was like, help. And she came up with, she found me an out-of-print book that had a lot of detail about what the police department in New York City was like prior to 1898. That's the kind of stuff that research librarians are really great for. Like, do the preliminary work yourself as much as you can. But if you ever, like, run into stumbling blocks like that, absolutely contact a research librarian. Books, obviously, are super useful I really like a documentary. There's tons of historical documentaries, both on streaming services and on YouTube that will talk about all kinds of things. Um, primary sources, of course, are super important, particularly if you're trying to get the language of a particular time period really down. Um, like, obviously, people in the 1890s don't 
speak to each other the way that we do now in terms of slang, in terms of speech patterns and formality. We're much less formal now. Um, and reading primary sources can really help you get a sense for what the language of the time period was like. Uh, go to museums. Uh, historical museums sometimes have really fantastic exhibits where you can really interact with and see objects from the time period you're studying or um, the fashion or, uh, for example, I went to an exhibit in Philadelphia a number of years ago because I was writing a book set in the Jazz Age and they had an exhibit at the National Constitution Center about prohibition and they had flapper dresses and they had mobster suits and they had tons of photographs from the time period and in one corner there was a whole distillery so you could see the mechanics of how that would work and seeing that stuff in person is sometimes really useful. Uh, there's a ton of great history podcasts and social media is actually really useful as well. Um, caveat that not everything on Pinterest is labeled correctly, so I don't recommend using Pinterest for your historical research, but um, there are a ton of historians on Twitter who are super fun to follow if uh, learning about history is your jam. Next, uh, if you're writing a fantasy world or even just a fictional setting, I find it super useful to draw maps. I'm actually currently writing a contemporary, but it's set in a small town and I needed to know where things were in approximation to each other, so I drew a map. You can create Pinterest boards um, that are sort of inspirational, that sort of give you the vibe of what the setting is that you're developing. Um, give everything a place name that makes sense for the setting. So say that you have a story that's set in a fictional town in New Jersey, you're probably not going to have streets named things like Palmetto or Palm. Uh, I typically, if I'm writing a fictional town, I will give the streets names of local flora and fauna just to sort of make that make sense. So like if I'm setting a story in Connecticut or New Jersey or New England or whatever, then I'm going to pick trees and animals for place names that are from that area. Give your businesses names if you have local businesses even if you're writing fantasy there's probably a pub or uh, some kind of gathering place uh, and giving them names can really help flesh out the story and use real geography where applicable so even things like uh, even Westeros or Middle Earth are sort of vaguely based on England so they're using in some ways they use some of the real geography of England in their in the way that the worlds are built, or if you're setting us it in the United States, or um, thinking about uh, Amanda Boucher's series, um, she wrote a fantasy series that's based really heavily on uh, Greek mythology. So a lot of the place names in her universe, it's not it's not like a real tangible place that you can visit, but she uses for her place names a lot of Greek words, and that sort of helps build out the story around the Greek mythology. A few other tips. For any setting, keep a Bible or a set of notes that can be referenced while writing to make the world consistent. Um, so just like if you need to know like streets, names of things, I have a really hard time keeping those kinds of details in my head, so I write everything down. Think about language for your setting. So regional slang, various speech patterns, you know, words like pop or soda or um, words like wicked or hella or down the shore, depending on where you're from. And um, think about regional speech patterns and how they might affect dialogue. So if you have, if you have a character from Boston or from Southeast specifically, he's going to have a particular way of talking that's going to sound different than if you, somebody's from Atlanta. Uh, think about including occupational jargon, particularly if you're writing like every occupation has its own set of words and slang and jargon. But if particularly if you're writing from the point of view of a character who has a particular job, like if you're writing an athlete, he's going to talk about sports in a way that's different from a casual viewer, or he's going to have a comprehensive knowledge of his sport in a way that like a lay viewer wouldn't necessarily. Um, but for any job, think about having that character use occupational jargon in a way that someone who works in that profession would. Also think about architecture, population, dense, population density, climate. Um, is it a beach? Is it the desert? Is it a forest? Is it a city? Does it, is there winter? Is, there, is it hot all the time? Thinking about all of those kinds of things to, can really flesh out your setting. 
to draw a conclusion, now that we've done all this work and gotten to this point, here's the sort of the big trick is that you only need to include details for your story that the reader needs to understand the story. So this includes details for the world and for the plot, generally speaking. So you should be able to justify every included detail and you don't want to bog your reader down in needless minutia. What this means is that you, the writer, should know everything about the world that, that your characters inhabit and you probably will know way more than it ever makes it on the page. And that will come across in how you're writing it because you'll be writing your story from a, an informed perspective. But that also means that um, there's a lot of stuff that's just not going to make it on the page. And part of that is to avoid info dumps or too much like exposition heavy chapters where you have to explain a lot of things. So just think about what exactly what kinds of details need to be included. To wrap up, uh, you can download my uh, setting worksheet from my website. It's available as a PDF at katemcmurray.com slash workshops. This will give you the space to develop your setting. And before you go, please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And you can follow me on Patreon at patreon.com slash katemcmurray. And there's not much content there now, but there will be very soon. Once I have a few subscribers, I'm going to start making more writing resources available in addition to the YouTube channel. So please check that out and have a great day.